Now, we all know that our present propulsion methods are quite adequate to get all sorts of things to Mars. And if we scale them up, we can get people to Mars, especially if they, we can shrink them to the size of Ken and Barbie. So, but what about the future? We, um, you know, on Earth, we evolved in transportation systems from the sail to steamships, finally the gas turbine, finally the nuclear power. Let's imagine that in the far future, we have access to new physics that allows us to modify space-time itself for propulsion. And if we're going to have that in 100 years, Somebody has to work on it now. So what I'm presenting to you is was presented at the Boston APS quantum field theory conference in August, August 1st. So Planck was the father of quantum mechanics. And um, he showed us that electromagnetic fields could exist not only as uh, radio waves, light waves, or Maxwell's equations, but also highly disordered. And um, yeah, we decided to let you speak on time. Okay. And they stuck me in to this gap. Okay, very good. Once more into the breach, my friends. <laughs> we'll fill it up with your English dead. So uh, we can actually have highly disordered electromagnetic fields that are not coherent. And the key uh, number, as it turns out for this, is a very interesting factor called it's 6 times pi to the fifth power is on the front of this uh, Stefan Boltzmann coefficient that he calculated using the first application of quantum mechanics. Now, this led down the road to Niels Bohr coming up with a way to predict the spectrum of hydrogen. They've been trying to do an electromagnetic theory of hydrogen with a concentrated electric charge in the center of the nucleus and electrons orbiting, but this didn't work at all because they, it would collapse radiatively. But Niels Bohr applied the quantization con uh, condition. He had the plant, the, the electrons moving around the nucleus in classical orbits, like planets around the sun. Now, this was wrong. But what's interesting is when he did all the math, all the errors canceled, and he ended up being able to predict the spectrum of hydrogen and also singly ionized helium. All very precisely. So he wasn't right, but he was close enough. So close counts in horseshoes and physics. If you have a conceptu uh, conceptually correct theory, sometimes you can end up getting the right answers even though it's, it's fairly simplistic and rudimentary. Now, I will uh, just do a quick introduction of myself, what motivated this. Um, anyone who knows me knows I've been coming to these Mars conferences for years talking about plasma propulsion, chemical propulsion, things like that. But I'll be talking about gem unification includes the Klein fifth dimension on which it's based, uh, models of gra electromagnetic gravity, the gravitation constant, which runs the universe, and the photon mass. And I will talk about, just gloss over the last parts of this talk, which are more details. Now, I am a plasma physicist. I have been um, started working on the problem of controlled magnetic fusion energy back in 1975. Um, the nice thing about plasma is the you know, plasma is the natural state everything in the universe and so um, just by learning plasma physics you 
gain a fair amount of knowledge about how the universe works. And now I work on fusion energy. I'm still working on it. Plasma space propulsion and breakthrough propulsion. Recently, you may have heard of the company called Momentus flying a revolutionary new space thruster, the microwave electrothermal thruster that uses water vapor as propellant. And as it just turns out, I invented it. Uh, and it's now being flown in space by Momentus. And I said, what kind of performance are you getting? And they said, John, we're not going to tell you. But for a scientist to invent something 30 years ago and then have it actually flying in space now is certainly one of the great satisfactions one could ask um, as, a, as a scientist out of life. So I'm very pleased. And of course, um, water is composed of hydrogen or oxygen. Hydrogen is the most abundant element in the cosmos. Helium is next. Oxygen is number three. So water is the most abundant element, abundant chemical in the universe. So if you have something that runs on water, you can refuel any place, especially at Mars and at the moon. So I'm very pleased with how that worked out. It's a great piece of plasma physics. And now it's flying in space. But I'm not happy. I want to go faster. I want to go cheaper. One asks oneself, is there anything in the cosmos that's even better than hydrogen-based fuel, like water, that one could use for propellant? The answer comes back, how about vacuum space-time itself? Can we manipulate that eventually? I'm talking far in the future. Don't pack your bags yet. But I want to go to Mars cheaply and rapidly. And this is not just a desire, it's a perceived necessity. I believe that the human race must advance. It must master these new concepts and technologies. It must try now if it's going to succeed later. So this requires me to go to the frontiers of physics. And I say, so be it. Um, if I want to keep, go to the threshold of physics, that's just a change of frame of mind. And what is that compared to traveling to Mars? So, this is an old, old problem. To master the manipulation of space-time with electromagnetic fields, to, to make gravity modification, one must have a theory that unifies the two long-range forces of nature, gravity and the unknown. This was the long effort of Einstein after he developed general relativity. He worked on it for the last 30 years of his life. But he failed because he rejected quantum mechanics. However, he discovered what was called the zero-point fluctuation spectrum, which gives Casimir forces. And he promoted publication of Kaluza-Klein hidden dimension theory. Kaluza-Klein hidden dimension theory is very valuable because you can begin with what's called a, a mathematical procedure called the Hilbert action principle, which is space-time as a bunch of like rubber, minimize its energy of curvature, and out of it falls Einstein's theory of gravity. Then, Kluge and Klein discovered if you add a hidden fifth dimension, what falls out then is not only Einstein's equations for gravity, but coupled to them, Maxwell's equations of electromagnetism. They come out exactly. It's, ama it's an amazing mathematical miracle. This was done back in the 20s. And 
basically has a, a small little dimension at each point in space-time. And it's a little bit like you have a great deal of freedom when you put this theory together because the theory puts no requirements on the size of the new hidden dimension, except to say that it is small. It's like saying, I want to design an elephant, and somebody asks me, what is the width of the hair on the elephant's, you know, size? And I say, that's not important. All we know is that the hair is much, much smaller than the trunk or the legs. And it doesn't matter how much smaller. So there's a great deal of freedom in the mathematics as long as you have the hidden dimension being small. Now, we can take this, and as a plasma physicist, I became aware of an effect in plasma physics called an E cross B drift, which I'll be showing you in a minute. And then also, um, we became aware of the, the idea of the Planck scale, where black holes appear and disappear due to the Heisenberg uncertainty. And you have a bunch of particles and antiparticles of the same mass. And you have basically one force. So you have a very simple structure for everything at the Planck scale. And if you imagine that a new hidden dimension kind of deploys out of that or inflates, like a big inflatable life, life raft, then one can have an idea of what would happen perhaps in the Big Bang. That the appearance of this new hidden dimension changed the universe from having one force and basically one particle in the form of particle and antiparticle pairs to suddenly a new, a expanding universe with two forces, gravity and an animal. And um, protons and electrons. In other words, a hot expanding cloud of hydrogen with gravity and E and L influencing that. So, and this would be triggered by the appearance of this new hidden dimension. Now, in plasma physics, we were obsessed with confining plasmas in magnetic fields. And one of the things that would come up is that if you allowed any electric fields in the situation, the, if you had two plates, let's say, with electric field between them and the magnetic field coming out of the board, if you dropped any particle in there, any charged particle, they would all end up drifting at exactly the same velocity in the same direction. Now, if you camp the two plates to each other and release the particles, they will actually accelerate and they will accelerate at the same rate. So you have something that basically, for individual charged particles, simulates gravity. And this is a simulation done for an electron and then a kind of 10 times heavy electron. And <clears throat> you can actually write the equations down for a kind of Newtonian potential. And when you turn that into a covariant form, in Einstein's uh, language of um, general relativity, where this is the metric tensor, this electromagnetic tensor becomes the metric tensor. So it looks as if there may be a possibility in this theory of changing gravity with electromagnetism, because in gravity theory, the metric tensor is everything. And of course, the electromagnetic field is our servant. We can change it. So there is a hope there. Now, if we imagine the birth of the cosmos from the Planck scale, where everything is simple, with one force, one type of particle, plus and minus uh, antiparticles, and then suddenly, boom, this new hidden dimension appears, a new, you can like think of a, 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 a 
aluminum plate and you're squeezing it and suddenly it buckles. It goes from being a two-dimensional object to a three-dimensional object. It develops a new dimension to relieve stress. So imagine that you go from this very simple Planck scale universe to suddenly a universe with not just one force, two, and not just one particle, two particles that are different. Electrons and protons and gravity in the NM. Now, if you write a mathematical model for this, at the Planck scale before deployment, is there a laser pointer thing here? Yes, not. You look at the very top, you can imagine that the square root of the mass ratio of the proton and electron is roughly equal to the size of this hidden dimension at, to the Planck scale, Planck length, and those are roughly one. Then suddenly you allow this new hidden dimension to appear, it blossoms, and you can choose because Kaluza Klein allows you great freedom to choose the actual size of the dimension, as long as it's small, you can choose its size. You choose it to reflect the fact that you've added information about protons and electrons. And it turns out then the ratio of the new dimension size, once it's deployed, is the same as the ratio of gravity strength between electron and proton and electromagnetism. So after the deployment, there's this number, which is 42.85. And if you insert that hidden dimension size after deployment into this equation, you get exactly the same number. Some people would say, well, that's a coincidence. I say, so is Bohr's hydrogen spectrum. No, that's information. So, I, uh, and of course, the 42.85, that's reminiscent of the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, which I was not aware of when I first began this theory. Someone else told me, they said, they said this sounds like a crazy science fiction novel I read. So, we have this equation basically equating the mass ratio of the proton and the electron, or the square root, to the natural logarithm of this ratio which is also the ratio of the strength of gravity to E and M between protons and electrons. Now, because you have this equation, and these two numbers are almost exactly the same, I can show you a, a, a calculation of them, you can actually invert this formula and find big G. And this is, of course, the first thing that I did in this theory. And here's what you get. This is the formula for big G, the most important number in the universe. It basically depends on hydrogen, masses of hydrogen, electrons and protons, electric charge. It has alpha, the uh, quantum electrodynamic fine structure constant which says that, electron, uh, that gravity is basically somehow basically electromagnetic, just like in the um, simulation we showed of the E cross B. There's only one other person who's ever published or attempted to try and calculate the gravitation constant. Jerry Tarouft, who won the Nobel Prize in 1999. This is his formula. Complete with a question mark, because it's off by a factor of a thousand, and he did not know what the, the factor was. But he published it anyway. And he published that in 1989. And just by coincidence, he wants to go to Mars too. He's head of the European equivalent of the Mars Society. So we're both looking for an answer to a problem. Is lens that we want to solve, at 
least 100 years in the future. Now, Jerry Hoof is much smarter than I am. And he's probably, he's also much better at doing quantum field theory. But my formula is within a part per thousand, a tenth of a percent, close enough for government work. His is off by the question mark. The difference between Jerry DeHoof and I is I have an advantage over him. I want to go to Mars more than he does. So, uh, as it turns out, the same theory then gives us the mass of the proton from the um, um, here it is. It's within about a tenth of a percent also. So it gives us the mass of the proton and the, uh, which generates all the gravity in the universe and the value of big G. So that's all very interesting. And uh, work has been, the further work has been done on this. Um, turns out, Wolfgang Pauli, one of the great characters of physics, hated Kaluza Klein theory, dismissed it as complete rubbish when it was first published. 20 years later, he added to it. He added a, another dimension, a sixth dimension, which really gives you quarks. And so he had the electricity split into three parts. Is the next presenter here? Yes. Yes. Um, yeah, so you're kind of already a little bit. Oh, of my goodness. Well, good. <laughs> Sorry. I'm not going to dwell on this except to say that we're trying to develop something we'll be using a hundred years from now, maybe even sooner. And this theory does allow expression of the um, space-time metric in terms of electromagnetic quantities. So it looks like we can modify gravity with strong enough electromagnetic fields in the future. And we are, of course, going to Mars. So thank you very much, and I'm sorry if I ran a little bit over it.